action versus contemplation. I'm the Frank Fryer. Let's get Frank about it. If you like what I'm doing here on YouTube, please make sure to click that little like button and that little subscribe button. That way you stay up to date with everything I'm doing on the Land of Carmel. And if you see that little bell icon pop up, make sure you click that also. Also, if you want to follow and continue the conversation about this video, leave a comment down below. I like to engage people in the comments section. Or you can continue the conversation over at the Twitter, at my Twitter handle, Carmelite Nick. Or if you're a Facebooker, go over to my Facebook page, The Real Frank Fryer. Two great resources to stay up to date with everything I'm doing in the land of Carmel. Enjoy the video. So last week in the live video, and uh, sorry, this one's not live this week, but uh, I'm actually during this day, this Thursday that this is going up, I'm being casted for a future prosthetic um, on my left leg. So uh, this is a pre-tape, uh, which is formally the normal, you know, method. But uh, there's a book I wanted to talk about a little bit, and I sort of hinted at it last week, but it's called Action Versus Contemplation right here. Why an ancient battle... Well, I should say on that's a little melodramatic. Why an ancient debate still matters is by from Jennifer Summit and Blakely Vermoulet, and uh, both have a very uh, prestigious academic uh, prestige and background and et cetera and all these sort of things. And uh, I heard them speak on a podcast. I can't remember the name of it off the top of my head. I'll, I'll, if I can find it again, I'll put it in the uh, links down below. And it was a, a great sort of little panel thing going back and forth talking about a very important thing, uh, action versus contemplation. And that podcast episode that I was listening to uh, was a, in a religious context. And uh, sorry, my legs bother me a little bit, so I'm a little jerky today. Uh, <laughs> Life of an amputee. And um, so I said, you know, I'm going to try their book. You know, I had some I had coupons. Um, so I said, you know, I'll buy it and I'll go with it. And uh, I have to say, I was utterly disappointed. Um, based on that podcast <clears throat> and uh, based on that podcast episode and everything, I thought it would have a little bit of an ac uh, aspect of a, of a religious feel to it. Uh, maybe not totally, you know, but at least something about the notions of action and contemplation within sort of the religious mindset, because contemplation itself carries a religious connotation, uh, even within your Eastern traditions and etc. Uh, now, obviously, I'm not going to spend the whole video talking about every aspect of the book, but it's very academic, um, and it talks about a variety of different areas, and it really boils down action to, uh, I would dare say, a, a capitalistic notion of production. So it weighs heavily on um, what action is like in our modern context, but how actions have been viewed, you know, the life of an active person through the life of history, but it always sort of boils down to producing, uh, producing something, producing some aspect for some communal group and et cetera. And contemplation sort of, sort of boils down to uh, either uh, having time to think thoughts and bring up ideas or uh, leisure. And that's the word that's going to lead me into the chapter I found most disappointing. They had a chapter on uh, work and leisure. And I dare say the f three quarters of that chapter was looking at one fable. A uh, very uh, important fable that we all probably know from Aesop, even though they talk about how it's probably maybe even older, but that's the ants and the grasshopper. You know, it's one we all know. The ants are working diligently over the summer, storing up food and etc. And the grasshopper's like, oh, why are you all worrying about that? He's just eating all that he can and enjoying a life of leisure. And then suddenly winter comes and, you know, the grasshopper, he don't make it out alive. And they went over and over and over the story short of sort of showing how different times within human history that fable was viewed in different ways you know maybe all uh, the ants were worked up as being a little bit more virtuous maybe the uh, grasshopper was seen as someone a little more virtuous and then they spent a large time looking at it from the context of disney because before uh what was it before uh, snow white and the seven dwarves they released the very famous uh, cartoon of, you know, the ants working and the grasshopper and et cetera, just going along as one of their first colored animated features. And also, of course, the Bugs Life that came out through Pixar. Now, then their whole talk of going over and over about how people view the ants versus how people view the grasshopper and all these sort of things and yada, 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 yada. That's kind of kind of how I felt when I was reading the chapter. They left out something very important in this critique of a very important fable. Um, sorry, I can't get much outside scenery in my videos, but I'm kind of in a wheelchair right now, you know, so, and it's hard to get around, but they forgot one very important thing in their critique as they're going into this fable and trying to show the ants as those of the act of life and the 
good old grasshopper is that of the contemplative life. Each character has no control over its exterior life. It didn't. The grasshopper can't stop the winter from coming. The winter will come. There are exterior forces within our lives that will impact us that we have no control over. I lost a limb. I had some level of control over that, but some of it was out of my control. You know, I had certain things I have to prepare for in terms of winter time myself. And to see these, um, and, and there's other great things within the book, mind you, but just to see that epic blind spot, I was very disappointed. Very, very disappointed, you know, because I come from a rural culture. And during the wintertime, those that work so hard during the wintertime, like the ants, now have the time to lend themselves all over towards that contemplative life. Now, they could have talked about that. But they talk about how, you know, in some manifestations of the fable of the ants versus the ants and the grasshopper, that the grasshopper was led into the ants' sort of home and he entertained them during the winter time, And they all lived happily ever after and et cetera. You know, so there was a time when, you know, farmers would be able to just be with their family and, and spend time towards that sort of cultivation of what we would call in a religious life, that, that meditative self that leans one towards contemplation. You know, and just to make contemplation, and one of the things that irks me is they invoke Teresa of Avila a couple of times, and they call her reformer of the church. She was never a reformer of the church. She was trying to reform an aspect of the Carmelite order within her country of Spain, because Spain just pushed out the Moors, and, you know, the rulers of that time, you know, Isabella and, you know, Ferdinand were trying to develop, you know, a strong, unifying identity for the people, and they grabbed down to the Catholic faith to do that. So, of course, you know, you have some people trying to intensify the karma way, way of life. Sorry, I'm just, when people misuse Teresa of Avila, I get a little, I get a little defensive, and I go on the attack. Um... So I, I just, I mean, if you're interested in a very, you know, geared towards more of an academic pursuit, but academics in the lens of our modern times and notions of what action and contemplation is, uh, go ahead and read the book. But if you're looking at it in terms of a religious context, um, you'll find the book sort of hollow, uh, sort of lacking. Uh, she invokes some of the other saints of the church, and they both these ladies, and they never use ST or they never acknowledge their Catholicity uh, that I can recall off the top of my head. And I was made, taking notes and everything while I was reading the book. Uh, it was just a total, total letdown. And I forced myself to get all the way through the book to see how it would end and etc. You know, because contemplation within a Christian context is always in relationship to the other. Because contemplation, that con comes with, um, comes from the foundation of Latin meaning C-U-M cum, which means with. It's always with another. And for us, that is Jesus Christ. And of course, obviously being the context they were in, they couldn't go down that road. So they made a simply contemplation about thinking ideas. Um, and thinking up stuff and having time to, incult, to cultivate the intellectual life, um, focusing more on a meditative aspect than a contemplative aspect. Uh, so I found it just very, very disappointing um, that their usage of the, the ants and the grasshopper I found is the biggest, um, like, how could you miss that that context of winter and et cetera, you know, when it's part of the story, uh, I found, you know, I, I was just sort of awestruck in such a gaping hole within their analysis and their critique. Um, now, does that apply to the rest of their academic work? No, but in relationship to this particular work at this particular time, you know, I find it lacking. But that's just my two cents. Again, that is action versus contemplation, why ancient debate still matters. You know, if you've got a couple extra bucks and you want to read something, it's a quick read. It doesn't take long. Each chapter sort of stand on its own, for lack of a better word. One of the other things is the two ladies, you know, they wrote it, and um, these two scholars, I should say, and, you know, they have these dotted lines that separate uh, their, I assume it is their voices, but they never tell you who's speaking which time. Like, is it, you know, Jennifer or is it Blakely and who is it? And and I never saw where in the introduction their structure of like, this is now my voice and that's now her voice and all this. So you get confused, like, well, whose ideas now are you wrestling with and et cetera. And then are they going back and forth against each other? Are they just putting forward their action or their understanding for the um, uh, reader to, to wrestle with? These are, you know... Uh, 
like I said, points of which are left uh, uh, very hollow and, and uh, lacking. So uh, a little frustrated by it, but I've got time to do more reading and etc. Thank you very much for your time today. Sorry I had to be the bearer of such <laughs> bad news on a book I didn't find particularly enjoying. But uh, know that I'm with you. Know that I'm praying for you. May God continue to bless you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you very much for your time today. If you like what I'm doing on the YouTube channel here, please make sure to click that little subscribe button and then that little bell icon. That way you stay up to date with everything I'm doing in the land of Carmel. And if you enjoy the video today, click that little like button also. If you want to keep the conversation going, please click or I should say leave a little uh, comment down below or if you're not one to do that go on over to Twitter and you can engage me over on Twitter at Carmelite Nick is my Twitter handle or if you're a Facebooker go around to Facebook The Real Frank Fryer these are two great resources to stay up to date with everything I'm doing in the land of Carmel know that I'll be praying for you <laughs>